The intent of this video is to discuss the bailout process of a B-17 bomber's crew member. It is the responsibility of the plane's commander to initiate the bailout process if he deems the plane is in such trouble that the only viable option for crew survival is to abandon the airplane. Several situations would require a bailout. This would include a crippling reduction in the airframe structural integrity due to enemy gunfire or mid-air collision, loss of flight control, uncontrolled fires, unfavorable landing terrain, or a combination of these events. Each crew member will perform their well-rehearsed bailout roles. First, the pilot would communicate the bailout intent by voice over the intercom, prepare to abandon plane, and provide the crew information on the plane's altitude, approximate position, and if bailout over water is expected. Each crew member will provide message acknowledgement. The pilot will then ring the bailout bell with three short bursts. Three rings signify get ready for bailout. Six short bursts for water ditching or crash landing. There were three bailout bells scattered throughout the B-17. One is located under the navigator's table, one in the radio room, and one above the plane's tail wheel boot. If you need to cancel the prepare to bailout order, then the flight engineer will be sent to relay the return to stations order. The bailout bells are loud and sound more like a buzzer. While at high altitude, the radio room operator would follow emergency radio procedures and send a distress message to Bomber Command's ground station. The information provided would include the plane's position, course, altitude, speed, estimated time remaining airborne, and intention to either bail out, ditch, or crash land. The high altitude is needed as the transmission distances increase with altitude for the VHF lies on radio system. The pilot would destroy the identification friend or foe IFF radio system. The radio the destru destruct switch box is located above the flight deck instrument panel. He would press the radio destruct switch box dual button simultaneously. This action would detonate an explosive charge built into the radio cabinet. The bombardier would destroy the Norton bomb site by firing two rounds from his Colt 45 pistol into the glass site telescope and one round into the rate end mechanism. The bombardier or pilot will open the bomb bay doors and jettison or salvo the bombs. The bomb's fuses will not be armed. An unarmed bomb will not detonate at ground contact. He will keep the bomb bay doors open during the abandoned ship process. The waste gunners will assist in egressing the ball turret gunner from his station. The ball turret guns will be depressed down. This will expose the ball turret's hatch inside the fuselage, which can now be opened and the ball turret gunner can be pulled into the cabin. Each crew member will remove their flak gear and helmet. The flak vest and attached apron is removed by pulling down on the quick release cord. The pilot and co-pilot will be wearing either back or seat parachutes. The remaining eight crew members wear chest parachutes. They will attach their chest parachute hook snaps to the parachute's harness's D-ring. Chest parachutes were too cumbersome to wear under flak vests or in the ball turret. If bailing out over water, crew members will connect their inflatable dinghy to the life vest's D-ring. Crew members will need to untether themselves from the plane's life support support and calm systems. First, crew members will unplug their heated garments electrical cord from the plane's rheostat. Second, they will unplug their comms cables from the plane's jack box. Lastly, they will unplug their oxygen hose from the plane's on-demand oxygen regulator. Since bailout altitudes could be up to 30,000 feet, crew members will need to plug their oxygen mass hoses into one of the small green portable walk-around bottles scattered around the airplane. A walk-around bottle can be clip to the parachute harness. Crew members will pass out in a minute at 30,000 feet without mechanically fed oxygen. A walk-around bottle contains about 8 minutes worth of oxygen and can be easily refilled in flight if needed. Doors used for bailout articulate in such a way that the air scrubbing pass a door will tend to apply air loads to force the door closed. The plane's three bailout doors will need to be jettisoned from the plane by pulling on the door's emergency release levers. This action will separate the door door from the fuselage. Crew members will position themselves in their predefined bailout locations and wait for the abandoned plane order. After the distress call has been made and if feasible and safe, the pilot would try to reduce both the airplane's altitude to below 15,000 feet and the indicated airspeed to below 150 miles per hour. This will make the jump from the airplane safer. The pilot will trim the plane for level flight and
and engage the plane's autopilot system. The plane's pilot will give the abandoned plane signal by one long continuous bailout bell ring. Crew members will exit the aircraft in a predefined sequence. You desire all crew members to depart the bomber at the same time to assist each other once they're on the ground. If jumping out at altitudes above 15,000 feet and without a bailout bottle, the crew member will take several last deep breaths of oxygen from his walk-around bottle, disconnect the bottle from the harness, and leave it behind and jump. The crew member should fall out headfirst and straight down while facing in the direction of the plane's travel. It is important that the crew members face forward and roll out headfirst. This will reduce the chances of your head catching the edge of the hatch or being slapped up against the fuselage by the slipstream forces. He was instructed to hold his breath as long as possible during the descent. Leave your oxygen mask and goggles on. Your mask and goggles will provide some degree of face insulation protection from the cold. The walk around bottle could be a hazard though flopping around while in free fall descent. He needs to leave it behind. The tail gunner exits the door in the plane's tail. The left waist gunner, right waist gunner, and ball turret gunner all exit out of the main cabin door in sequence. The navigator and bombardier exit out of the plane's front entrance door in order. The radio room operator, upper turret gunner, co-pilot, and pilot exit out the bomb bay. The pilot is the last crew member to leave. This is the first time crew members have ever jumped out of an airplane and there are no reserve parachutes provided. While at initial free fall, every fiber in your body will be telling you to pull the parachute's ripcord. If nothing else, you will want to know if the chute will deploy properly and take advantage of the limited free fall time to fix any deployment issues. Crew members were instructed not to pull the ripcords until you reach an altitude around 5,000 feet. There are many solid reasons for this advice. Deploying a parachute at an altitude of 30,000 feet can be dangerous for several reasons. At 30,000 feet, the air density is 37% the sea level value. A free falling crew member's terminal velocity will be much faster at higher altitude thin air than at low altitude thick air. A person's free fall terminal velocity substantially decreases with altitude. At 30,000 feet, the crew member's free fall terminal velocity is around 175 miles an hour. Deploying a parachute while traveling this fast will subject the crew member to a dangerous parachute open shock deceleration load factor of around 27 g's as the parachute blooms. Your vertical speed will be reduced from 175 miles an hour down to about 20 miles an hour in less than one second. It is safer for the crew member to free fall and deploy his parachute at around 5,000 feet. He will have slowed down due to the 5,000 foot thicker air to a terminal velocity of about 115 miles an hour. The parachute opening shock deceleration value will be reduced from a dangerous 27 G's to a tolerable 11 G's. Recreational skydivers experience parachute decelerations of around 5 G's. The outside air temperature at 30,000 feet is around minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It is best to free fall quickly through the cold air to the warmer, low altitudes. As a rule of thumb, air temperature decreases 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 foot in altitude gain. Delaying deployment of the parachute from 30,000 feet to 5,000 feet will reduce the susceptibility of hypothermia or frostbite from 20 minute cold exposure to around 2 minutes. The oxygen levels at 30,000 feet are also around 30% the sea level values. Free falling to lower altitudes will minimize the susceptibility of oxygen deprivation or anoxia. There are documented cases of bomber crew members passing out during high altitude parachute jumps only to regain consciousness at lower altitudes. Combining a high load factor parachute deployment shock with hypothermia and anoxia is a dangerous risk force multiplier. You don't want to deploy your parachute while in the middle of an air-to-air -air or ground-to-air combat space. Debris, parts, shell casing, leaking fuel, falling from other bombers and fighters is hazardous if they make contact with your large, exposed, helpless parachute. Best to free fall out of the battle zone before parachute deployment. Although frowned upon, there were documented cases of German fighters firing at Allied flyers in a parachute descent. Delaying the deployment minimizes the likelihood of exposure to fighter attack. A high altitude parachute deployment 
Summit also provides ground enemy forces better opportunity to track your very visible descent. It will take about 20 minutes for a crew member to parachute descent from 30,000 feet all the way to the ground. By delaying the parachute deployment to about 5,000 feet, the total exposed descent time will be reduced to only about 7 minutes. Delaying parachute deployment increases your chances of evading and capture by the enemy. You cannot steer the parachute. Crew members were instructed to keep their legs together, hold on to the risers, and face the direction you are drifting. You can rotate your position by manipulating the parachute risers. You can estimate the altitude by observing the changing ground features. At 5,000 feet, ground features will seem recognizable, the horizon spreads out quickly, and the ground seems to be rushing up to you. This is the time to deploy your parachute. You will land in around 4 minutes after you deploy your chute from 5,000 feet at a vertical speed of around 14 miles an hour. Assuming no crosswind, this is equivalent to jumping from a height of 6 feet 4 inches. Try to tumble sideways or forward upon ground contact and collapse the chute if the ground wind is high. The crew members can now apply for the Caterpillar Club membership. To become a member, you must have bailed out of an aircraft under emergency conditions. By the end of the war, there were 34,000 club members who were issued a pin and card. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.